This video will conclude my overview of the history of Judaism. Uh, it meant to be a 15 minute video, but it's turned into three parter. Excellent stuff that will be over 30 minutes long. So I ended off with the different uh, groups that emerged within Judaism in response to Hellenism and how they approached and reacted to being under um, essentially Roman rule, right, and Greek culture. Uh, very paganistic, polytheistic culture in which they didn't necessarily have the stability and way of following God's law and keeping some of the commands that were in there under, under this, this, this leadership. Uh, this is a good explanation, again, as to why the Jews couldn't just crucify Jesus themselves. They had to go to Pontius Pilate because they didn't have that right anymore to execute people under Roman rule. So they always, if they wanted to follow through with a uh, penalty, which is prescribed in the Tanakh, for the Jews to keep with, with certain laws that were broken, they had to actually get permission first. Uh, first century then, uh, obviously this is after Christ and his death and resurrection, we get the second temple. It's actually the third temple. So that's interesting. I'm pretty sure it's the third temple. Herod's temple uh, is destroyed 70 AD. And then, obviously, the Jews are like, oh, man, we're done. Like, God's presence has left us again, right? Because that's where God's presence was. Uh, and throughout this time, all throughout the, this, this, this time period, there were other people rising up and claiming to be the Messiah. Uh, one such person... Uh, if I'm opening up my book here, find his name. It's really actually, I guess, not that important. But there were various different messiahs that, or false messiahs that, that rose up and tried to gather God's people together to overthrow the Romans. And so Jesus was actually thought by many to just be another, uh, another person in the line of many, right? <laughs> But here's, here's the one that has essentially kick-started the Jews being dispersed from Rome. It says, another revolt began in Israel in 132 CE. Some declared its leader, Bar Kokhba, to be the Messiah, the long-awaited Savior sent by God to the Jews. Uh, we might note that the Jewish concept of Messiah was generally that of a general or a king-like ruler who would have military powers. In 135 CE, the Romans put down the second revolt even more cruelly than the first, with many public executions. Jerusalem was demolished and rebuilt as a Roman city. Uh, and the Jews were forbidden to live there. So the diaspora then took place, the dispersion of the Jews, they went out to all different areas. They weren't allowed to live in Jerusalem anymore. Essentially, they lost their, quote, promised land. Uh, this is where rabbinical Judaism begins. Uh, I made a video earlier showing the distinctions between biblical Judaism, which focuses on those observing those Levitical laws, centering around the... The, the temple and the Levitical priesthood and the sacrifices and the festivals that pertain to that temple. And now if the temple gone and being dispersed and spread out, how do the Jews then observe uh, God's word that was given to them, his, his, his law? And so rabbinical Judaism is based on interpreting the scriptures and their oral tradition and then applying it into this context without the temple. Uh, 200 AD, we have this uh, Mishnah, it means repetition, so it's specific laws and their application. Uh, 400 AD, we get the Talmud, which means study, and so uh, it's the, essentially the Talmud we consider as like the footnotes of like a Christian study Bible. This would be the teachers and how they look at God's law and apply it to their current setting. Uh, how do we practice this law? How should it be worked now when we don't have the temple? Things along that line. It also contains culture and history of the Jews, which is not recorded in God's word. And as we know that culture and history, we can then better understand and apply the uh, the Tanakh to our lives, and so that's that's what the Talmud's doing. It's Jewish rabbis doing that. 600 AD, we have the Babylonian Talmud. Uh, when we when people say Talmud, they're actually referring to this Babylonian Talmud. Uh, so for the Jews, the Hebrew Bible is the first importance, but second importance is the Babylonian Talmud. And let me tell you, it's exhaustive. It's the size of like a whole encyclopedia set. It's it's huge, and I, I've actually seen this in, in Hebrew before. And the books were like this tall, this thick, this wide, and they took up like an entire wide shelf, and it was all, it was all in Hebrew, and I was just like, wow, this is, this is really amazing. It was even handwritten books, the one I was looking at, so it must have been a very old special copy. Anyways, uh, just, just know that for the Jews, though, this, this Talmud is very important because it helps them know how to live out um, 
God's word. Uh, Spain and Iraq, uh, during the diaspora, Islam and medieval Judaism, they were together, right? And these people seem to get along because the Jews viewed, I mean, the Muslims viewed the Jews as peoples of the book. They, they had some of the, they had the same prophets as they had, right? And so they seem to actually get along because they both recognize that there's one transcendent God. Uh, this is where Jewish academies uh, were born and they continued the tradition of learning that produced the Babylonian Talmud. Some of the works that were produced by them were the Guide of the Plexed and the Mishnah Torah. Another uh, interesting event occurred during uh, the Middle Ages. Uh, just reading straight from Michael Malloy's fourth edition here of uh, Experience in the World's Religions. It says, the Middle Ages saw renewed interest in Jewish mysticism. The whole body of Jewish mystical literature called the Kabbalah, and the Kabbalah means received or handed down, began to emerge even before the common era in works that speculated on mysterious passages of the Hebrew Bible. So again, they focus on speculation. Uh, so some of it, like we know Enoch. Uh, Genesis says, Moses wrote, that Enoch walked with the Lord and then he was no more. We don't have an age for him. We don't have like a, a death for him. So what, what, he just walked with the Lord and he was no more? Like, what does that mean? So he was taken up into heaven. And so they build whole theologies around these speculative uh, sections. I mean, there are Christians that do the same thing now, building whole doctrines and systematic theology around very questionable sections such as the Nephilim. And if you're not familiar with that, I believe it's Genesis 8. Read that. Read the footnotes. You'll be like, wow. So that, that's where Christians stand on like one verse of the Bible. That's a lot of speculation. And essentially that's what the Kabbalah is. So just to give you an idea there. Uh, they took a very non-literal approach to reading scripture. It's very symbolic. Something interesting here. They also took an approach called the Gematria. And I may be mispronouncing that. But gematria, what it would do is it's a special key for mystical interpretation. The practice, is, the, pra, the practice of transposing words into numbers. For example, Aleph, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, would be given a value of 1, the second letter Beth, a 2, and so on. In this way, the letters of every word could be added up and correspondences between similar sums could be found. And so it's essentially like a Bible code. And Christians do this now too. So there's like this idea of mysticism, this hidden esoteric language that just these specific people can receive um, from God and be, have the inside track. So it's like almost an additional revelation hidden within God's direct revelation that special people can receive of this special decoding process. And so Christians, there's some Christians that do this as well. And so this is Kabbalah for you, um, this sort of mystic, esoteric Judaism. Uh, and so is it even Judaism? It's an interesting question. But the Zohar is the most famous Kabbalah book. If you're interested to know more about what they believe and teach, you can look at that book. Um, just some interesting stuff here to give you an idea of where they're going. Uh, the Zohar, it was long believed this is a teaching from it. It was long believed to have been written in the first centuries of the Common Era, but in actuality it was probably written about 1280 in Spain by Rabbi Moses de Leon. The Zahar sees the universe as having emerged from a pure, boundless spiritual reality. Not God? Like, this is almost moving into, like, Eastern language, right? Which is, again, why we say, like, the Eastern philosophies and religions have uh, orientation which focuses on mysticism, right? This, this inner sort of spiritual reality, not as much like a transcendent God. Anyways, uh, kind of interesting. Kabbalah. In medieval Europe, uh, obviously with uh, Christianity being the rule of the land, uh, Christians received the title more as like the good citizens, right? And the Jews were considered the traitorous people that crucified Christ. And so Jews were kept out of guilds. Jews were excluded from urban work. Uh, during this time, though, Christians were also forbidden to lend money. So this is where the Jews, not having some other trade, not having this, this inner work into the unions, were able to uh, take up lending money. Uh, and I believe that's where the tradition of Jews being bankers uh, likely derives. But... Uh, Jews during this time were highly persecuted. Uh, they were forced to wear caps or some other form of dis distinction that they were Jews and not Christians. And they were forced to live in ghettos. Um, so they were essentially separated from the rest of society. Uh, I would say that's not very Christian <laughs> to do that. But I think that can also be the pitfall of when you have man, sinful man, Christianity... And so the church mixed with the government, you're going to get some very sinful practices like this that don't proclaim Christ. 
Uh, 15th and 16th century, you have the Renaissance. Judaism, at this point, moved in two different ways. One way, cherished tradition. This would be the Hasidic movement. The other way uh, went the route of modernization, uh, the move out of the ghetto. Uh, let's, let's drop some of the practices that are really distinguishing of us and just begin to blend into society. They're in the 1880s to 1920s. Uh, more than a million Jews came to the U.S., most through New York. Um, hence, I mean, there's a large Jewish population in New York. Uh, the Holocaust is obviously a uh, very brutal, difficult part of human history for all of us. Um, and it should be an eye opener to all of us. But the Jews, of course, received a lot of persecution. Six million Jews were killed. Uh, Rosh Hashoah is a, a day in uh, Israel and other Jews practice it too, uh, which is it's a day dedicated just to remembering the Holocaust and the suffering of the Jews. Uh, after the Holocaust, uh, Israel was reformed and the Jews were given essentially their, their land back. Uh, this was done by the UN. And so this is where I'm going to stop my Jewish history. But just know that like this is where they've gone. They went from being uh, Abraham to this great nation of people that were set free by God um, from Egypt and they were then led into this promised land that God promised them and throughout the course of history they've lost that land numerous times and any time they lost it it was a result of their sinfulness and rebellion against God and rejection of his word um, but here, here they are again given this land uh, and obviously, I think the Jews would still say and interpret this as having come from God, what they have now. And there's a lot of theology on all sides now, Muslims, Jews, Christians, that center around this piece of land. And what I would say for Christians now, in light of the New Testament, our promised land is not a line on the map. All right, It's not a plot of land that can be drawn and measured. Our promised land is God's heavenly kingdom. And that is where we're looking towards. And as Christians, this land, this whole world that we have now is our wilderness. This is not our home. We are strangers and aliens in a foreign world. And we are traveling through this land, following God as he leads us, not by a pillar of fire, but by his Holy Spirit that did descend upon his first apostles in tongues of fire. And we are following that Holy Spirit through this wilderness uh, to our promised land, focusing on Christ. And one day we will cross that Jordan River and we will be with Christ forever in eternity. And it's going to be great news. And along the way, we are bringing in as many people into the fold as we possibly can, uh, Jews included. They, um, they need to hear God's word, all of it, not just the Tanakh. They need to hear the gospel. And uh, I think as Christians, we can look at the Tanakh and easily see how Jesus was foreshadowed throughout the entire thing and even prophesied about. And so I would just pray and ask all Christians watching this just to, to think about how we do share common history with the Jews and how all of mankind shares common history with Genesis 1 through 11. And from that, like, let's just go where God leads us um, as the Spirit leads us and proclaim his word boldly, knowing that the gospel message has the power to save. Um, that setting aside a plot of land like the UN did with the Israelites, it, you know, it may help save the Jews from another holocaust, another form of persecution, but it's not going to save them from physical death. And it certainly doesn't save them from spiritual death or eternal death. And so the gospel is the message that needs to be proclaimed. That is what saves and everything in the Old Testament is physical based, physical sacrifices, physical temple, physical plot of land, uh, which foreshadows and points to the new spiritual reality. It's, it's not new, it's always been, but the spiritual reality of the New Testament, which is a spiritual priesthood, spiritual sacrifices, and a spiritual kingdom, which is not of this world.